Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum. Today I have sort of a hybrid video for you. This is partly a book review on The Scout Rifle Study by Richard Mann, and it's also partly a commentary and or critique on both the scout rifle concept and the concept of the scout rifle, I suppose? It's a little, little tough to describe, perhaps. So to start with, a couple years ago I did a video on the Steyr Scout Rifle itself. The Scout Rifle, quote-unquote, is a concept that was uh, created by Colonel Jeff Cooper, most famously of Gunsight, uh, and he ended up, over a period of many years, working with Steyr Arms in Austria to create basically a commercial version of his vision of what the Scout Rifle really was, and that is embodied in the Steyr Scout Rifle. And the video I did a couple years ago was highly laudatory of the, the rifle, and I stand by that. I think that's a fantastic rifle. It is good enough that in the aftermath of doing that video I went so far as to actually get one for myself, and I really like it. However, what I was looking for when I purchased the Scout Rifle Study, when I, to be honest, when I discovered this was available I thought, that's going to be a cool book, I definitely want to get that, ordered a copy, and was left a little bit unfulfilled. What I was hoping for was an exploration of the pros and cons of the scout rifle concept, the places where it was particularly useful and the places where it perhaps wasn't. Specifically, if you, if you really break down the scout rifle concept, which by the way is approximately the first hundred pages, or almost the first half of this book, is a history of Colonel Cooper, gun sight, the idea of the scout rifle, it, it really is sort of a, a ballad of, of Cooper and Cooper's ideas. If you really break down the scout rifle it is fundamentally a short light handy rifle, uh, with the distinctive element of a forward mounted telescopic sight. So this has a loopholed scout scope on it right up here. That, as much as some people want to say a scout rifle is so much more than just a forward mounted low power scope, the fact of the matter really is that this is what is the distinguishing factor of a quote unquote scout rifle. Uh, Cooper has some specifications for the length and the weight and the caliber. Um, this is generally spoken of as a general purpose do everything rifle, but in this is one of my concerns. Like this is within the context of do anything as in has to include hunting. So like it has to be capable of taking a moose, regardless of whether you live in a place where you might run into a moose. Uh, and this is largely because Jeff Cooper was a huge fan of African safari hunting, and it was something that he did on a regular basis, something that he wanted his firearms to be built around and suitable for, and the scout rifle was his thing, so that's what he made it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a universal thing though. Now. Um, one of the things that I was hoping to find in the Scout Rifle Study was a discussion of the, the forward mounted scope. Is it really a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Obviously neither of those questions has a definitive answer. The real question is, in what circumstances is it good or bad? Now if we look at the specific reasons why Cooper advocated a forward mounted scope, there are three, and they're well enumerated in the book because Cooper wrote about them. And that's the first half of the book, is going over exactly what Cooper said about this, about that, and about everything else. So number one is that it allows you to get a sight picture with most of your field of vision unobscured. So if the scope comes back to here, especially if it's a particularly large scope, you're not going to be able to see anything up close, like in your peripheral vision around the scope. By mounting it farther forward and having it relatively small and low profile, you keep your peripheral vision. All right, that sounds like a good thing. Number two is being able to reload the rifle without having the scope in the way. And before the advent of the Steyr Scout and some of the other pseudo scout rifles that are on the market now, these were all basically blind magazine guns. If you wanted to reload it, you reloaded it from the top. And so there was value in having the scope out of the way so you could do that. Um, these early guns didn't have detachable magazines. So, uh, And the third was balance, so that you can grab the gun right here by its balance point when you're moving around with it, 
and uh, and not have the scope get in the way. And all of these things sound like valid rationales. However, there are some downsides. Nobody is arguing, even in the book, they make it, they make clear that the forward-mounted scope has some limitations. It's not nearly as good at gathering light. If you're shooting in low light near dusk or near dawn, this is distinctly inferior to a traditional style scope, which is going to let a lot more light through and give you a much better opportunity to pick up a target. And then there are also questions about speed. This is generally regarded, generally uh, advertised, as being a faster setup, um, because perhaps you have both eyes open, it's lower magnification, it's, it's something that's touted for snap shooting. So what I was hoping to find in the book was a discussion of where that's appropriate and where it's not really the case. And unfortunately, I didn't find that. Um, the first half of this book, as I've said, is, is a sort of an archiving of who Cooper was, what Cooper did, how Cooper came to the scout rifle concept in the first place, and how he defined the scout rifle, because this is something that he redefined subtly over three or four or five different publications. Uh, you know, the exact barrel length would change a little bit from year to year, the exact weight would change a bit from year to year. Uh, and then the second half of this book is a kind of a catalog, a discussion of a wide variety of scout rifles, and that was that was interesting to me. Um, it includes a bunch of commercial sort of pseudo scouts, uh, like the Ruger scout rifle. Uh, Mossberg had one, Savage had one, as well as some early custom built scout rifles on things like Remington 600 actions, as well as some more custom rifles. Um, there is discussion of one here that is a lightweight AR-10 platform. Uh, which is discussed and then sort of arbitrarily relegated to the side as, well, it doesn't really count. Um, and it doesn't count because it's regulated heavily in some places, and thus not everyone can get it, and therefore it's not a true general purpose scout rifle. I think the real primary issue is that in Africa, as a basic rule, you can't take a semi-auto rifle hunting. So it's not an African safari rifle, and thus it's not worthy of discussion as a scout rifle. Which is... I'm not, I'm not sure that's the most practical general purpose standard to have, but there it is. Now the author, Mr. Mann, also includes a series of tests that he came up with to test the efficacy of a given scout rifle, and they're, they're good tests. They're uh, snap shooting, shooting from different positions, uh, some elements like shooting under duress. Let's say your magazine has failed, or you have run out of ammunition. One of the tests is start with a cartridge in your hand, or on a cuff on the rifle. Uh, without using a magazine, load it into the gun, take a kneeling position, and hit a target as quickly as you can. A relatively small target. So they seem like good tests. And I was interested to look at the results, and what I found was that the top three rifles in his test, and he had I think 15 total, none of the top three actually had scout scopes on them. Two of them had traditional rear-mounted optics. One was a 1-4 Trijicon, one was a 2-8 Leupold, and the third place rifle actually had iron sights on it. The Leupold scout scope equipped rifles and uh, the, like the Burris pistol scope equipped rifles all came after that in the aggregate scoring, which isn't addressed in the book. I would think that that would be a substantial, like, in your own testing, the scout scopes didn't actually outperform the traditional scopes. And that's something that I've kind of wondered about for a long time. Of If this is really as good of a concept as it's made out to be, why isn't it more commonplace? It's, it's very much a niche sort of click uh, idea, uh, preference. And what I have to, the conclusion that I have come to somewhat reluctantly is that it is in fact sort of a religious thing. It is based on this is what Cooper said, and therefore it is correct even if maybe there's some data to the contrary, or even if some of the basic assumptions may not be all that valid anymore. For example, one of the other defining characteristics of a scout rifle is that it must have backup iron sights. And this is largely rooted in Cooper's mistrust of optical sights, which it's been many, many decades. It's been almost 50 years since Cooper started tinkering with this idea. The scopes we have today are not the scopes that we had in the 1980s, and perhaps it's worth reconsidering 
how much sacrifice one should make to the rifle to accommodate iron sights. Part of the idea here is that if you've got a scope mounted all the way back, it becomes a lot more difficult to have iron sights, where if you mount your scope forward, you've got a nice, generally speaking, a nice mounting point right here to put a rear sight, and then the front sight can be dealt with. By the way, the official Steyr Scout does in fact have iron sights. They fold down out of the way, and they're super cool. I think that's a really neat idea, and I have no problem with it. My question is, is it really appropriate to be eschewing the, iron, the, the telescope these days? There are a few other elements of what really kind of look like cognitive dissonance to me that come through. Uh, so for my own personal purposes, I have, I'm left with the question of, do I want to retain this with a loophole scout scope on it, or do I want to use a traditionally mounted scope? Because when Steyr made these rifles, they were forward-thinking enough and practical enough to realize that not everyone would want this thing, and so they have the ability to mount a traditional scope on this. So when I look at the, the three basic criteria that, or the three basic reasons that Cooper had to use a forward-mounted scope, I'm not sure how valid they really are. So the first one is field of view, and that's, that's still relevant, that's still appropriate, and, and everything said about it is correct. However, you give up, for getting that field of view, you give up magnification. This is a two and three quarter power scope. Uh, you know, I, there are times when I might really like to have something more, at least four, maybe six power, maybe even something like, well, what is very commonplace, say a three to nine adjustable. You can't do that with a scope like this. Uh, there are some adjustable, like there's a Burris two to seven extended eye relief scope, but at that point you get into some really tight eye boxes at high magnification and a small field of view. There are trade-offs for these things uh, just because of physics. So I'm not convinced necessarily that for a general purpose, say a hunting rifle, um, the peripheral vision is that important relative to the sight picture that you can get. I'm not so worried necessarily about being ambushed from the bush to my side while I'm trying to get a sight picture on a deer or something. Although to be fair, I'm not shooting in Africa and I'm not worried about, you know, a cheetah sneaking up on me. Uh, number two is the ability to reload the rifle without the scope in the way. Well, Steyr has made that a non-issue because this has detachable magazines. I load it from the bottom anyway. So to my mind, that that point is out of the running. That That's meaningless already. And then the third is balance point. And he is absolutely correct that the balance point of this rifle is right here, and it's pretty handy to carry this way. However, there are other considerations. For example, to my mind, one of the practical things that one might want to do with a hunting rifle is not need to wear ear protection by, say, putting a suppressor on it. This is very, very common practice in Europe, uh, where suppressors are not regulated to the extent that they are here in the United States. Guess what? If I put a suppressor on this, it moves the balance forward to right under the scope. If I had a traditional scope on this, I'd be holding it here without the scope in the way, getting the exact same end result that Cooper was looking for with the forward mounted scope. Now, granted, uh, throwing a suppressor on here kind of in many ways ruins the balance of the rifle. It makes it substantially heavier. Uh, one of the fundamental criteria for a scout rifle is limiting the weight to something like three kilograms, seven, seven and a half, maybe six and a half pounds. It was, it is considered a rock solid fundamental standard defining a scout rifle, and despite the fact that it changed over the course of when Cooper was describing it. And more to the point, the Steyr Scout doesn't meet the weight requirement anyway. So I think we have another element of some cognitive dissonance going on where this is the de facto anointed scout rifle as declared by Jeff Cooper. But it doesn't actually meet his criteria, but we can then also use those criteria to very confidently say that some of the alternative pseudo-scout rifles on the market are not true scout rifles because they don't meet the criteria. Well, this one didn't either, but it it is given it's given a pass by the fact that Cooper said it was okay. So how how serious are these rules anyway? Um, I will say, like I 
don't take this as me not liking the scout rifle. I really like this rifle. I really like the detachable magazine. I like the fact that there's a second detachable magazine stored in the buttstock. I like the style of the stock and the comb. The trigger is fantastic. Uh, I like the length, I like the light weight of the gun, even though it doesn't quite make the official scout rifle standard, and I love the idea of the integrated bipod. I am a huge fan of light, handy, and easy to shoot. In fact, when Carl and I did our What Would Stoner project, we worked on a lot of the same basic criteria. The idea of having something that was rugged enough for field use, but also lightweight and handy above many other considerations. So this rifle is not intended for a huge high volume of fire, because it has a very thin barrel. It is intended to be very multi-purpose, with a variety of optical setups that you can use. It has a flashlight if you need to use it in low light, um, and the unitized receiver pistol grip and stock make it a very strong rifle. Those are fundamentally many of the basic concepts that went into the Steyr Scout. It had to be lightweight, it had to be short, it had to be handy, but it also had to be durable enough to take out in the field in Africa without having to worry about it breaking. Now there are some fundamental differences, obviously. Uh, caliber is one of them. The Steyr in, well, the scout rifle, as it came from Jeff Cooper, was primarily intended to be a hunting rifle where the what would stoner carbine uh, is intended to, what would stoner do carbine, is intended to be a competitive or a fighting rifle. Um, so some difference on styles, but I think fundamentally two different rifles that are aiming at the same basic goals. So uh, that is a very long-winded, I think, way around talking about the Scout Rifle story by Richard Mann. So what I will say in conclusion here is that if you're looking to decide if the Scout Rifle is something you want or not, I don't think this is really the book for you. I think this is primarily a book for people who like the Scout Rifle, want to know more about it, they want to know the legacy, the lore, where this came from, who else does it, how are other, what are other ways that people are doing Scout Rifles, um, and, and how they do or don't fit the agreed upon sort of dogma definitions of what is a Scout Rifle. So um, the book is available through Amazon. Uh, it's not badly written, it's not badly photographed, I wouldn't say it's magnificently photographed either. Um, the content is, buy this book for the content I suppose is what I'm saying. So um, if you are a fan of the Scout Rifle and you want to uh, be further educated in the ways of the Scout Rifle, this is absolutely a book for you, you'll love it. If you're looking to try and decide if like what are the practical pros and cons of the Scout Rifle, this book sort of takes it for granted that you'll already have agreed that it is the best rifle, because it is, and because Cooper said it was. So you're not going to find a lot of, uh, of good arguments in here, uh, that are persuasive arguments, because the fact that the Scout Rifle is best is just sort of taken for granted as the starting point of the book. So hopefully I don't get in too much trouble for this. Uh, there are some people who are very, very attached to Cooper and to his various ideas. And once again, in general, I really like them. Um, there's just, in my mind, a little bit of a matter of uh, application today. So uh, you can pick this up on Amazon. I don't remember the cover price off the top of my head, but I will put it down in the description text below, along with a link where you can pick it up. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.